part of this together. Virtue lies in choice in action. Virtue's power to exalt transcends the boundaries of soul, spirit and species, guiding and inspiring both orcs and humans to their highest destiny. Through the practice of virtue, orcs and humans develop the strength, knowledge and enlightenment which marks their highest potential as thinking beings. The Doctrine of Enlightenment Overview During the autumn equinox, the General Assembly upheld a change of doctrine proposed by Lady Clarice Navarian of Dawn. It is a fundamental change to the doctrines of the faith. It builds on the work begun by the Imperial Orc priests Bonewall Wreck and Bonewall Cole, which saw the addition of the Doctrine of the Howling Abyss and the Doctrine of the Ancestors, but is even more seismic in its implications for the faithful. This change officially marks a fundamental shift in the way within the Empire. Accepting that the power of virtue transcends the boundaries of soul, spirit and species accepts that both orcs and humans can gain strength from virtue. It also raises the implication that there is more to the pursuit of virtue than just speeding the passage through the labyrinth. Scholars are already debating what it means for someone to develop the strength, knowledge and enlightenment which marks their highest potential as thinking beings. The change of doctrine is embraced with surprisingly little pushback within the Empire itself. For many priests of the way, all save the most hidebound, this change feels natural. Ever since the Imperial Orcs were accepted as the tenth nation, they argue, this has to be where the way goes. It's been two generations since the Imperial Orcs became a nation. One cannot look at fellow citizens, people prepared to fight and die to protect you and your way of life and fail to see the virtue in their actions. The positive example set by the Imperial Orcs has systematically eroded support for those who clung to once traditional views. The self-fulfilling mandate. There are inevitable attempts to try and pick apart the new doctrine looking for a flaw. As priests across the Empire pour over the new doctrine and begin to discuss it, there are always people who are happiest finding fault in the works of others. Some make lofty philosophical arguments about what is meant by enlightenment, while others critique the explicit reference to orcs and humans, asking what this means for a Healy. A small army of carpers, cavaliers, scolds, pettifoggers and smellfungers take up arms to do battle with the new doctrine, only to find their positions quickly overrun. It helps that the elegant cadence of the new doctrine evokes the timeless qualities of the founding statements of the way. People who are familiar with how difficult it is to get the modern synod to agree on anything are struck by the strength and clarity of the prose. There is widespread praise for Clarice Navarion and her fellow priests charged with drafting the new doctrine, especially from those who feared that the new doctrine might be tediously lengthy to flatter the authors or pointlessly banal to render it acceptable to the widest possible audience. Those who expected the worst are confounded to discover the new doctrine is poetic, both articulate and eloquent in equal measures. More importantly, the wording of the new doctrine is powerfully inspired Inspiring. It presents a vision of the way that is based on choice and action. It requires that people acknowledge that virtue is the birthright of all thinking beings. It demands all thinking beings aspire to enlightenment through the pursuit of virtue as their highest destiny. It achieves the impossible, satisfying Urs and Caesars who demand a doctrine that withstands intellectual rigour, highborn guardians who want words of wisdom to adorn their armaments to fortify the soul and marcher friars who want an exhilarating sermon they can deliver under drafty canvas in a muddy field. As Ephraim of Rivers Hold calmly puts it, you can tell this is the right change because the moment you hear it, you sense at once that this is what the doctrines of faith should always have been. In a sense, this is what they always have been. This is what we have always believed, only now the Synod found the words to describe it. They have done their job, now let us do ours. This acceptance that the Synod has got this powerfully and inspiringly right is not ubiquitous, but it is widespread. In other times, a statement by the Synod that was this significant and far-reaching might create the opportunity for a mandate, a chance to use the powerful benefits of Lao to spread the teaching to every corner of the Empire to bring about results quickly. But the change of doctrine wins over so many Imperial priests that it is eagerly embraced and swiftly promulgated across all ten nations. Supplies of personal Lao are expended, creating auras to energise, infuse and inspire those who seek to spread acceptance of the new doctrine to every part of society. The result of this mandate is a flower with three petals. The first is a surge in pride in the Empire and the Way. These are dark times, with many threats looming, and arguably the enemies of the Empire have never loomed larger. The change of doctrine gives people faith 
that the Empire will find some way to embrace virtue and triumph over its enemies. The second is a renewed interest in the Assembly of the Way, the Assembly whose purpose it is to speak with authority on matters related to the wider practice of the faith and of doctrine. Priests of every virtue are taking in a renewed interest in the words and the often overlooked assembly. The final petal is the acceptance of orcs. Prejudice against the orcs has been declining and this puts a nail in its head. Anyone being leery of an orc just because they are an orc is likely to be given short shrift from here on. The relevant mandates read, to remove the doctrine of human destiny and replace it with the doctrine of enlightenment. The virtuous inspire others to greatness, they do not demean them. Let us celebrate the spiritual power of virtue without degrading our fellow pilgrims. Let us inspire orcs and humans as equals in the way, with a true expression of pride and ambition. Clarice Navarian, Change of Doctrine, Autumn 385 YE, Upheld, Greater Majority, 3013 to 159. The change of doctrine proposed by Clarice Navarion will cause serious thought and concern among the Empire's priests. We remind you all, with thanks to Ironville Ricker the Relentless, that doctrine is a living document that must change and grow as the Empire does. We must not fear change, but embrace virtue where we find it. Vivian de Coeur de Feu, Assembly of Nine, Autumn Equinox, Upheld, Greater Majority, Eight to Nil, and Primacy. Renewal of the Faith Statements of principle that urge people to support virtuous causes are more likely to result in a mandate. Statements of principle that call out unvirtuous decisions are more likely to result in a mandate. There's been a lot of disruption in the way in the last 10 years or so. The faith was nearly split by the Yalin schism. The role of the orcs in the way was a matter of constant discussion. The Grey Pilgrims triggered questions about the ways the different nations celebrated their faith. The Severin encyclical caused a year of spirited debate as to the role of the Synod in the politics of the Empire. The Sword Scholars ignited a struggle between the General Assembly and the Virtue Assemblies, and many more besides. For some, the Empire and the Way seem to have become too much about politics rather than about the pursuit of enlightenment. With the change of doctrine, many of those questioning the faith in the Way feel empowered, as if their faith and the Empire it supports have taken an indefinable step towards something greater, a higher destiny that accepts orcs and humans as equals. It's heady stuff. The renewal of faith has created a rising tide of pride in the Empire's future. The Imperial institutions may be beset by problems, but when has this ever not been true? The Declaration of Enlightenment demonstrates clearly what the purpose of the Empire is, to encourage orcs and humans to reach for the strength, knowledge and enlightenment which marks their highest potential as thinking beings. Or at least what it should be. If this change of doctrine is to mean anything, people want it to be reflected in the way the Empire acts. Citizens, pilgrims and priests are looking to the Synod to see that it is ensuring that the pursuit of virtue is at the heart of everything the Empire does, and they are eager to support it. For the coming year, statements of principle that urge people to embrace a cause through a cogent call to virtue will be more likely to result in a mandate, as will those statements that call out choices and actions that were made in a way that denied virtue. Look to the way. Priests with congregations who preach the way this downtime and until the start of the autumn equinox 386YE receive two additional synod votes. Statements of principle passed by the Assembly of the Way at this summit will have enhanced impact. The Assembly of the Way is assumed to provide leadership to the priests and pilgrims who do not prioritise any one particular virtue. They are expected to be well versed in matters of the way in general so that they can speak with authority on matters related to the wider practice of the faith and of doctrine. In recent years, the prominence of the Assembly of the Way has declined, with more focus being placed on the seven assemblies of virtue. With this major change to doctrine, however, there is a dramatic increase in interest among both priests and layfolk as to what those priests who prioritise the way as a whole over the teachings of a specific virtue have to say. Priests who preach the way after the autumn equinox rather than a single virtue find their congregations swollen, receiving two additional votes in the Imperial Synod as a consequence. This benefit will continue for a year until the start of the autumn equinox 386YE. Each season, the congregations of priests who preach the way will gain the additional votes at the next summit, assuming nothing changes in the meantime. During the coming winter solstice, however, eyes are on the Assembly of the Way as acknowledged custodians of the doctrines as distinct from the virtues. Any statement of principle upheld by the Assembly of the Way with a greater majority will be examined by priests across the Empire, not just those who preach the Way in preference to individual virtues. This will mean that, for this summit only, statements of principle in the Assembly of the Way with a greater majority will prove as powerful as a statement of principle with a greater majority in the General Assembly provided it is speaking of the way, 
the doctrines or the new doctrine of enlightenment. A different time. The change of doctrine has increased acceptance of orcs, notably those of Apulus, Mormald and the Great Forest. We have updated the national briefs to reflect the widespread adoption of these changes. The widespread and passionate embrace of the change of doctrine serves as a powerful panacea to prejudice across the empire. It helps ease acceptance of the Mormald orcs, making it impossible not to recognise them as fellow marchers. It nurtures the growing relationships between the Great Forest Orc steadings in Thurunin, Hersinia and Miaran. Ironically, it makes life more challenging for the Apulus Orcs. Before, there were still some inclined to see them as benighted creatures not worthy of the attentions of the rich and powerful. Now they are acknowledged as the equal of any merchant prince, worthy competitors in the grand game of the cities. The benefits are felt beyond those nations where Orcs are settling. It helps that the Imperial Orcs armies have been active in every nation in the last few years, fighting alongside Imperial soldiers, publicly supporting the Empire. It is increasingly difficult for any citizen to deny that the Empire has grown stronger because of their presence and their role in it. Discrimination and prejudice towards Orcs has been steadily dwindling in recent times. The change of doctrine accelerates that process. It can't change the past, but it can change the Empire and lay out a new future. The wider way. The change of doctrine is public and quickly communicated to pilgrims of the way in other countries. Imperial priests are quick to send letters communicating the change of doctrine to pilgrims of the way in other lands. Of course, such letters take weeks or more to arrive. Few have the resources and the manner for a winged messenger, so the responses are likely to play out in the coming seasons as nations slowly take account of the change and what it means. There are a few immediate responses, however. The Sumar Republic. The Republic do not accept this change of doctrine for now. They will encourage those who look to Timoj to retain the doctrine of human destiny. The Sumar Republic greet the news of the change of doctrine with interest, cordial and polite. They will certainly discuss the implications of these changes the Imperials have made to their understanding of the way. Yet, as with the addition of the so-called Orc doctrines, the discussion will take time and there's absolutely no certainty they would accept anything similar. There is a world of difference between a doctrine that enshrines humanity as having a unique destiny and a doctrine that says all beings are capable of virtue. It would be a mistake to confuse this reticence for condemnation, however. The Sumar are by no means up in arms at the changes, they aren't denouncing the Imperial Synod as heretics or blasphemers. From what limited correspondence there has been, there's been a lot of interest in the implications of virtue being fundamental to everyone, that strength of spirit and enlightenment of soul can be something to strive for while alive. It will just take time, a few decades at least. The fact the two great nations have chosen to cordially split their faiths from one another helps here significantly. If the Empire were trying to force this change on the Sumar, they would push back. As it is, they recognise it simply as another difference in the approaches the two synods take to the world and the spread of the way. They politely inform their opposite numbers of the Assembly of the Nine that they plan to enact a mandate during the winter solstice that will urge Sumar missionaries and those who look to Timoch for guidance to both reject the doctrine of enlightenment and retain the doctrine of human destiny until such time as it has been carefully weighed, considered and judged. Of course, once the grand inspiration of the way is complete, there will be few outside the borders of the Sumar Republic that will look to their Assembly for guidance, but that great work is still some distance from being completed. In the meantime, the Sumar will continue to send out their missionaries and continue to establish their own perceived moral authority. The Commonwealth. The Commonwealth are enthusiastic about the change of doctrine and what it portends for the Empire. The Commonwealth already integrates Orc citizens within its nation. The Way is a minority religion among them, but those pilgrims of the Commonwealth enthusiastically welcome this change. The Commonwealth enthusiasm goes further. Even those who aren't adherents of the faith approve of the development. The Empire has gone up in their estimation. The Sarkovan. The Sarkovan regard this as a judicious, well-considered change. The Sarkovan are a little more restrained. They have much less interaction with Orcs for a start, and their interests are much less spiritual in general. The majority of Sarkovan, who are not adherents of the Way, seem to regard this change of doctrine as a shrewd, judicious move, one that will make it easier for the Empire to engage in trade and diplomacy with their neighbours, with less spiritual baggage weighing them down. There are pilgrims of the Way in the Delves, however and many more than there were a decade ago due to the presence of the Cathedral of the Navigators built by the Empire and the House of the Delves constructed by the Sumar. They are receptive to the new doctrine, but acceptance will be slow due to the missionaries from Timoj urging caution. The General Assembly, the Assembly of the Way or the Assembly of Nine, could enact a mandate to promote acceptance of the new doctrine. This mandate would read, 
Doctrine is a living document that must change and grow as our understanding does. The doctrine of human destiny has been weighed and found wanting. The doctrine of enlightenment provides a deeper understanding of the way of virtue. We send named priest with 25 Lao to urge adherents of the way in Sarkavan to follow the lead of Bastion in embracing this change. Synod Mandate, General Assembly, Assembly of the Way, or the Assembly of Nine. If this mandate is passed, then it will increase engagement with and acceptance of the new doctrine among both established pilgrims and converts in the Delves. As things stand, the change of doctrine could take years to get widespread acceptance, but this mandate would shorten that time dramatically. However, it is likely to annoy the Sumar, who will take the view that they are being more even-handed with the faithful Sarkophan by urging people not to accept the change of doctrine. It won't trigger the Sarkophan limitation on the two cathedrals that they remain civil and avoid brawling in the streets, but it would raise tensions. One particular fact that crops up, one of the Sarkophan merchants happens to mention they discussed the change of doctrine with the Elokar and they were apparently very impressed with them. He was gone before anyone could ask for more details, which is unfortunate because nobody has the slightest idea what that means, who the Elokar are, or why they might have an opinion on this change of doctrine. It doesn't seem to be a Sarkophan word or refer to anyone or anything in the Delves. The Asseveans. There are no open followers of the way in the Asseveian archipelago these days, and it's hard to tell whether the secret pilgrims, most of whom are slaves, even know of it. Most of the hidden followers of the way in Asseveia look to nearby Timoj for guidance and support rather than Bastion, but it varies widely. The Empire's involvement with the followers of the way in Asseveia have been variable, whether it was imperial mercenaries fighting on both sides during the short-lived civil war that engulfed the northern provinces, the establishment of the doomed temple of the Seven Virtues in Nemoria, or the recent mission of mercy to the Calatropos. But the message of the Doctrine of Enlightenment is profound, especially for people who are not free. If they have not heard it, perhaps they should. The General Assembly, the Assembly of the Way, the Assembly of Nine, or the Highborn Assembly could enact a mandate to urge missionaries and wayfarers to take news of the Doctrine to the hidden pilgrims of Asseveia. This statement would read, The Doctrine of Enlightenment provides a deeper understanding of the Way of Virtue and its role in giving us the strength, knowledge and enlightenment to achieve our highest potential. We send named priest with 75 Lao to urge missionaries and wayfarers to bring this news to the hidden sects of Asseveia, no matter the risks. Synod Mandate, General Assembly, Assembly of the Way, Assembly of Nine, or the Highborn Assembly. If this mandate is passed, it will speak to those with a zeal for bringing the way to the furthest corners of the known world and encourage them to make the perilous trip to Asseveia to make contact with the hidden sects of the pilgrims there. This is monumentally risky for the individuals who are inspired to do so. Beyond the fact that the Empire is at war with Asseveia, there are rumours the priesthood there has started executing adherents of the Way wherever they are uncovered. Many of those who answer this call will not return. They will become martyrs of the Way. But whatever else happens, they will ensure the people of Asseveia who need it most will hear the change of doctrine and the promise it holds out for those who embrace virtue. Others. The response of the Iron Confederacy is not fit to print. There is no official response from any barbarian nation, but the Grendel is smug about the change of doctrine. The idolaters in the Iron Confederacy worship an entire pantheon of patently made-up gods, some of which may or may not be Eternals. They despise the way, and their society is unashamedly one that relegates all orcs to second-class citizens. The Iron Nobility are all Naga, which sometimes give the impression that ordinary humans and others with other lineage are not considered their equal, but orcs certainly aren't. Their response to the change of doctrine is not fit to print. There is no official channel for informing the barbarian nations that the Empire is at war with the change of doctrine. It seems unlikely that the Yatun or the Druze will care one way or the other. However, it is clear that somehow the Grendel have found out about it, and their response might be best described as smug. Of course, this is the Grendel. Acting smug is their typical response to every situation. In the Principalities of Yarn, the news is greeted with disinterest. The Magician Princes do not encourage public discussion of religion. But those who do practice the way, albeit in private, will know of the change. Slavery remains endemic in Yarm, the basis for much of their society, but comparatively few of their slaves are orcs, most are human. As such, the change of doctrine should be relatively unthreatening to them. The Aksu were positive about the change of doctrine. They have always been clear that the labyrinth is a place of eternal suffering, where the malign creator works its evil deeds on mortal souls, grinding away every remnant of their personality until they are completely helpless. Any change of doctrine that means the Empire reduces the emphasis on reincarnation as the spiritual focus of their faith is one the Aksu approve of. They regard this change as a profound decision, one that moves the Empire to a more enlightened state, better able to perceive the evil that the Creator works on the world. Future questions. The change of doctrine is new. 
priest of the way are busy discussing among themselves and with their congregations what it means. The words of Cardinal Vivian de Curdefer remind everyone that the way is a living faith, its doctrines subject to change as pilgrims learn about the world and their place in it. There are a lot of questions, but the basics seem straightforward enough. The doctrine of human destiny has been weighed and found wanting. But this has caused a resurgence of interest in other questions. What is the role of exemplars and paragons in the faith, for example? The doctrine of the paragon feels adrift, without the doctrine of human destiny shoring it up, more concerned with the procedure for recognising a paragon than explaining what one is. The new doctrine doesn't deny the importance of the paragons, the doctrine of the paragon still exists, but it challenges the perception that the paragons are capable of personifying virtue or the full potential of humanity. The doctrine of the creator still speaks of human destiny rather than the destiny of thinking beings. Should it too be changed? And what of the orc doctrines? Since they were upheld, the Empire has encountered many new groups of orcs, many of whom think differently to the Imperial orcs. Are they still clear enough? Still fit for purpose? The Imperial Synod have achieved something momentous with this widely appreciated change of doctrine affecting the Imperial faith, the thing that ties the whole Empire together. They have improved the way, strengthened the Empire and inspired the faithful. What next?